heaven. Ask Westerners what they think that word means, and you will get two answers, I bet. One is something that's above the trees, something that's up there, a little bit farther up than uh, we can really reach. Maybe if you climb the mountain, you can be in heaven. The other idea is something that's afterlife, something in the future. And if you ask about where God lives, heaven's not a bad answer, but the idea is, well, he's up there above the trees, maybe on mountaintops, um, or he's kind of in this afterlife sort of thing, place that's not even in our universe, that's just kind of far away and you only get there when you're dead. Well, we're going to talk about that today and whether that actually is the biblical picture of heaven. I'm going to suggest right at the beginning that it's not, that that's not what the Bible means when it talks about heaven. Um, I'm here with uh, Vila Cavilo to um, help me do that. Um, I'll introduce him in a second, but let me just say here at the beginning, I am Michael Stewart Robb, better known as Mike, and this is the Sanctus Forum. We are doing the conspiracy conversations here. That means we talk about Dallas Willard's The Divine Conspiracy. Um, and we are, uh, just mention it right at the beginning, we are in chapter three, really one of the most uh, brilliant chapters in the book. And we're doing a section here called The Heavens as the Human Environment. For me, it's on page 66 in, in this um, edition. This is one of those longer ver longer videos, so a podcast means uh, there is a audio-only podcast version, which you can watch, um, especially if you get tired of looking at us. Uh, you can just um, listen to us, which I don't know if that's any better. <laughs> um, you can also, while you're looking around for the podcast, by the way, just look for Sanctus Forum on wherever you'd like to listen to podcasts. Um, but do subscribe to the channel or to the podcast thing, like things if there's like buttons that just helps people um, find this, write reviews on uh, podcast clients uh, or platforms, and sign up for our almost monthly newsletter over at sanctus.institute, and then you can hear more a more robust picture of what we do at Sanctus, which is a at European Institute for Theology and Spiritual Formation. All right, I'm so excited about having Villa Cavilo on this show. I guess it's a show. It's a uh, show. It's a show. <laughs> um, and we are here in his home in Finland, which is really exciting to be able to kind of fly up and, and do a conversation with him in his own space. I've been here for a few days and um, have been in two saunas. That's why my hair <laughs> is kind of like this, is sort of always taking showers and steam and so we'll kind of smooth it out a little bit. Um, Vila studied at uh, Avo, um, Avo, Avo. Obu Academy o University. Obo Academy University yeah. in, uh, in Finland. Um, it's, um, he comes out of a Swedish speaking part of Finland and if you didn't know there are sort of um, Swedish speaking parts of Finland and actually the university is a Swedish speaking university in Finland. Um, he, uh, one thing that I've always been fascinated by is he, he started these spiritual formation groups there at the university and got other co-students involved in them. and. Um, I've met a lot of those people and they have certainly benefited from those times of just getting together and talking about um, books as well as practices as well as ideas. Maybe we'll hear a little bit more about that in this conversation if it fits. Um, something else, he wrote his master's uh, thesis on Dallas Willard and I think that might have been how we maybe, well maybe not the only way we found each other. but. Something that um, there weren't too many people 
um, back in the day who were writing specifically on Dallas Willard. And uh, here this guy in, in Finland was one of them. Um, he's a photographer, entrepreneur, and coach. Though right now he does um, two things, I think. He can maybe correct me if I'm wrong. First is he is a priest in the Evangelical Lutheran Church of Finland. He, he did study theology at the university and now they, they have him uh, performing mass and um, yeah, all sorts of sacraments, preaching um, in, a, in a parish here. And he is with his brother, works in a brewery here in uh, uh, Kokola is the town that we're in. And uh, I've got some of the, some of the products here, um, lager. They do all sorts, of, all sorts of things. I don't know how far away you can actually get these. Um, all of Finland so far. All of Finland. So yeah. if, you, if you live in Finland, you're good. If you're not, then come visit and... So, soon abroad as well. <laughs> Soon abroad. Okay. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, they are good. I, I've. I don't think I've tasted a bad one. No. Y yeah, yes, you did. I did taste one yeah, that you, I thought. I yeah, don't. Yeah. This is. But that's not on the beer, Mike. That's I don't know about. That. <laughs> <laughs> um, you just haven't found the sour beers yet. <laughs> sour beer. Yeah. It's like. I don't know. It's not for me. Um, he is uh, also a graduate of the Renovari Institute. Some of you may know the Renovari Institute is a two-year program, and uh, Vila was in one of those cohorts. And that's kind of how we met. Um, some of those people then knew of you, hmm. and I knew them, and then they said, oh, there's this guy up in Finland um, who, who likes this stuff, and... And then I wrote to you, um, and yeah, we've known each other for about six, six years, six years yeah. I think. Yeah. Yeah. Um, now tell us here a little bit, how, how does, how does Dallas Willard get all the way up to Finland and reach a guy like you? Well, it starts off with a young, over ambitious, almost over zealous kid who wants to read and learn as much about Christianity as possible. Okay. Uh, so I, I, I was part of a church confirmation camp. And during that camp, I had a pers personal encounter with God. Mm -hmm. And, and there, as a part of a small revival amongst the youth here in our congregation in Kokkola. And from that, a, just a curiosity awoke in me. So I, I went through pretty much all the theology stuff that I can get at my local library. Mm -hmm. And slowly but surely, I started to listen to like apologetics on the web and, huh? and Veritas Forum. Huh? And through Veritas Forum and also uh, John Ortberg's book, The okay. Life I've Always Longed For, uh, I kept on stum stumbling upon this Dallas Willard okay. guy. And I was just fascinated by how somebody can use words hmm. to articulate truths about Christianity, the Christian faith, and about Jesus in such a way that it was just, I was mesmerized, okay. really. Uh, and I got surprised by the fact that, you know, in, in, the, in the preface for The Life I've Always Wanted, uh, John Ortberg writes that he's doing kind of a Dallas for Dummies series. Uh -huh. So I was like, well, what's this Dallas for Smarties? Because obviously I was on an intellectual high thinking that yep. I'm this high and mighty smart person well, reading Kierkegaard when I was a young kid, not understanding anything, but yeah. I thought I could understand. Yeah. And um, I guess that's, there's, there's some, something good in ignorance as well, because that brought me to a article in one of the um, Renovare spiritual uh, formation guides uh, on the spiritual classics for uh -huh. divine reading. Yeah, there's a article on discipleship that Dallas wrote, and right. that I, I can still remember sitting in my it was kind of like a dorm room in Obo mm -hmm. during my first three months away from home, away from from everything, just reading this article through so many times and using it for lectio as well. And, and really just finding it so interesting. Hmm. And that kind of got me 
down, going down through the rabbit hole. This was in 2004 yeah. for, for that article. Mm -hmm. And from, from there on, like this, I got this one from my friend Laura. She, mm -hmm. She's been on the Yeah, for, Laura so, has yeah. been on the yeah. So she, she got this from New York in 2005, and I, I remember just plowing through it. I was immersed in it, mm. and it was fascinating to read. And I really, really find it, found it so interesting and educating and inspiring. Mm. And especially the, the chapter that we're looking at right now, I can yeah. remember the spot in Obu Academy University Library, one of the spots by, by the Aura River. Mm -hmm. Looking out, uh, everything was like the spring bloom was in the air. It was a bright, sun, sun, sunny day. I should have been studying something, but I couldn't. Mm -hmm. I was engrossed by by this book, mm -hmm. and especially the first kind of the the, the first part of the third chapter. Just mm. I I seldom used the word, but it literally blew my mind. As mm. I, it was mind boggling because mm. there was the combination of aesthetics uh, and precision when thinking about God that painted a picture of a truly happy being mm -hmm. and yeah. someone who's just enjoying being themselves mm. immensely mm. and someone who I could think like well I I can love this God this mm. God I can love mm. I can I can share this God with the whole universe yeah and I, this is just there's beauty and joy and 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 a kind of an abundance of lightness yeah yeah so that's that's the short story of of how i kind of got yeah. into the writings of dallas Willard. right but then you you met dallas too yes. didn't you yes twice uh i met dallas the first time when i was doing uh, studies abroad okay uh, i was at laurentian university uh, in sudbury about five hours north of of toronto I flew down with the same Laura that gave me this book to Wheaton mm -hmm. for a, a conference on spiritual formation in 2009 and sat through his uh, talks and really enjoyed them. I even got a paper from him that he said, okay, you read this and you comment and I don't know what the equivalent of a research assistant's um, trying to give some comments on their idol is to yeah. a writer's block but that's what i got big time i just remember pouring it over and i, I have nothing to say there's nothing i can better here yeah yeah okay so uh, uh, i've got to talk to him ask some questions have him pray for me and that was a a significant meeting you know? yeah they 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 tell people not to meet their idols but uh, in this case, I, w I definitely recommend it. It, it yeah. was inspiring and it was nice to meet someone who, who not kind of actually fits the feel hmm. of a person you meet through their life writing. Yeah. And the second time over was doing the Santa Barbara cohort of the, the Spiritual Renovare. Formation Institute uh, through Renovare when he yeah. had one of, as I know it, one of his last public appearances yeah. for the teaching in in the institute yeah he might have done some more that i don't yeah. know of but yeah and and that's where i got to ask him my my thesis question so that kind of that kind of ruined all the fun in writing a thesis and having the <laughs> <laughs> question being yeah. answered by, yeah. by, by the writer themselves yeah. but it quick, was good quick tip if you're writing a thesis on a living person don't ask them the answer after you've written the thesis <laughs> ask them first if you're gonna do that then write it don't write it and then ask them pro tip pro tip yeah, yeah. It's, a pro, it's a pro tip <laughs> yeah okay okay um you're um i I'd said you're you're a priest uh, and that you give mass but that sounds like you're roman catholic it does sound like it i mean and the Evangelical Lutheran Church in Finland, if you look at the global Church of Christ, we kind of look and feel and taste Roman Catholic. Okay. So if you have a Roman Catholic from abroad mm -hmm. 
who's just well versed in their own mass and they happen to stumble upon a mass in the evangelical lutheran church in finland mm -hmm. it it would take some time for them to figure out especially if it's in swedish or finnish mm -hmm. that this was not a roman catholic church okay but we are standing proudly in the lutheran tradition yeah. as protestants uh, but we have inherited uh, the form and the yeah. language uh, and the aesthetics of the Roman Catholic rite. Yeah, yeah, that's it's it's a fascinating blend. I yes, guess, it is. Say. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, you mentioned that you really like this uh, chapter, and that's one of the reasons um, why I really wanted to. There's a flying creature here. Um, we'll see here how annoying that gets for us. We may have to pause and put the creature out of its misery. Um, actually, it's probably having a wonderfully happy life, and we will just end that. Um, so I wanted to talk to you about this because I, I know that this uh, made an impact um, on you, and that's mm. always helps for a, mm. a good conversation. Mm. Um, first thing that Dallas says in here, I'll just read it. With this magnificent God positioned among us, Jesus brings the, uh, brings the assurance that our universe is a perfectly safe place for us to be. And then, and then he goes on and he gives his um, translation, loose translation of Matthew 6 about not worrying about what we eat and what we drink and what we wear. Um, so I read this and I thought... I think I thought, I, I hope that's true. Like, I really okay. want to believe that. Wow. Um, a perfectly safe place to, to be. But I think you, you realize that your, your body, the way that you have been living, um, just really doesn't, wouldn't tell you that's true. I don't live in this world as if it's perfectly safe. Um, and what it is, I have a lot of, worry and anxiety about things, um, maybe not about what I eat and what I drink, but other things um, just doesn't seem like uh, things are all right. So what was your what was your reaction when you read that? It was a uh, it was a slap in the face. OK, yeah, it, it, I, I remember having kind of a very visceral, almost angry reaction. Oh, because it, it, it didn't it, it didn't jive with my experience. Hmm. Um, Dallas uses this example of Jesus being walking among us like a cat who's never been kicked. Yeah. Yeah. It's just kind of leisurely, relaxed, mm. uh, at peace, at ease. And that's, I'd say, the opposite of the majority of our lives. We have the experience of being kicked in one way or another. Yeah. Through personal trauma, through the experience of being through a war or seeing yeah. atrocities in life, injustice and so forth. So it almost feels like a offense yeah. to talk about how life can be safe. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so that's, that's just my first like, primal reaction is, mm. uh, are you kidding me? Yeah. Like that, that's yeah. not a fair thing to say. Yeah. And yeah. I, I guess, I guess there's something in me that's just really thinking about all the pastoral counseling, soul care, spiritual direction that I've been a part of and that I've been part of as, as the one uh, providing it as a service and seeing like, okay, this is psychologically a really, really hard fact of the kingdom to absorb to the level where your cells hmm. absorb it as a truth yeah uh, where your nervous system kind of re relaxes into it as a reality yeah. where your imagination your way of perceiving the world aligns with jesus's way hmm. of seeing the world hmm. of having that same view of the actual physical reality that we all partake in. Yeah. Now, that being said, there is true hope hmm. for those who live in the midst of a world broken mm -hmm. 
to see there's another way. Yeah. Like there, I I don't have to live as a part of a uh, of a world history written through pain and anger and vengeance mm. and bloodshed. Yeah. I can step into a story about a life in which God's actual day-to-day -day providence becomes a lived out experience where I can walk in the same manner mm -hmm. that Jesus walked as a cat who's never been kicked yeah. or a cat who's found security again yeah yeah because they found that they have a master who takes care of them yeah yeah despite having been kicked despite having been kicked and yeah. probably also having kind of a deeper appreciation hmm. for this life i mean if you look at the life of jesus he certainly had his bouts all the way up to the cross of meeting yeah like it's it's not like he was this sheltered kid who never yeah. experienced any hardship i mean he was living up in a, yeah. uh, growing up in a, a a very hostile environment yeah so having the peace of god right in his bodily being yeah. which is count, kind of how i read him through the through the gospels like yeah. he's a he's a bodily manifestation of what it means to walk in god's peace in god's peace and and especially with the passion story you see a guy who's being kicked or about to yeah. be kicked yeah. and not to think of jesus as somebody terribly anxious no, about exactly. that what's going to happen to him yeah. or is happening to him but somebody who's um is able to find peace in the broader universe mm -hmm. or broader economy of what God is, uh, God is doing to just say, it, this is okay. Um, because this is not the, the end of, of my life. I mean, that's, I think that's one of the, the main points that I hear or heard <laughs> Dallas mention when it comes to, uh, Jesus asleep in the boat. Yeah. He chides the disciples because they haven't stepped into his worldview. They're right. not they're not aware of the fact that no matter if they live or die, yeah. everything's okay. Yeah. Like he, the, he says, Why why were you afraid? Yeah, yeah like what's, and, what's up guys? You know, it's like <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. Why 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 were we afraid? <laughs> what, what, yeah. We're just gonna <laughs> die. <laughs> Drown a horrible death. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That isn't, that's not good. But, um, but Jesus... I'm, like like in that... Imagine yourself being a professional fisherman. Like mm -hmm. actual person who has been brought up since they were a kid. Yeah. On big waves, big sea. And actually being the point where you're afraid for your life. You're afraid for your life. Yeah. yeah. Like this is not the first someone someone brought up in the desert and all of a sudden find themselves amongst the uh, m amongst like uh, high waters. Yeah. Like these are professional fishermen who find themselves right scared to death. Yeah. 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 Like I have a bit of a compassion for those guys. <laughs> yeah. It feels yeah. a bit unfair from Jesus' side yeah, to yeah. kind of go poke at their inability yeah. to step into the kingdom. Yeah. yeah. But you see there the, the contrast between how we humans are trained to mm. deal with difficulty and hardship in our lives versus how Jesus is saying, well, this could be lived differently. Yeah. And in this passage here, I mean, if you if you have the book with you or, you know, you have a Bible with you, it's probably more likely, you know, reading again this passage in in Matthew six, where um, where Jesus just says, there really isn't any reason to worry. Mm -hmm. There really isn't any reason to worry. You can be concerned about things, but to worry about them. Not not in this world, not with mm -hmm. God mm -hmm. in charge. And, 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 and living in that reality uh, as a disciple of Christ, I mean, the disciples themselves were at the hands of a master teacher. That's just, that's kind of the feel like if you're going to, if you're going to deliver a pedagogical master class, mm -hmm. then meeting people in the, in their most intense experiences. Mm -hmm. and help rewire their nervous system towards another way of relating to the situation of hand is where you get the experiential 
pedagogical mastery that you see in Jesus. Like he can actually have that God view in the moment, in the boat, in the storm going, hey, there's another way. No. We, you, you don't have to be scared out of it. Yeah. You can. You're, it's yeah. okay. I can, I can deal with this. Yeah. Yeah. But this is not the way it has to be. Yeah. The yeah. world can be a perfectly safe space. Right, right. And I think what's interesting is that that was, you have to imagine that being in Jesus' body, not yeah. just something yeah. he's thinking about, and, yeah. um, but something that just was, he was already trained to. Um, accept and to act in a certain way. Um, Dallas, uh, Dallas is here case for his statement um, has a lot to do with the, um, the closeness of God. He says here that this, this view can only be supported on a clear eyed vision of a totally good and competent God um, or that a totally good and competent God is right here with us to look after us. Mm. And then he says, his presence is precisely what the word heaven, or more accurately heavens in the, pur in the plural, conveys in the biblical record as well as through much of Christian history. Mm. Um, heaven's kind of a tricky word when you read it in the Bible because... Um, I guess I wonder if it's really just, it just has been mistranslated and we're just so used to these, a traditional translation that we're not yet prepared to translate it differently. That's, I think that's probably what, what, what Dallas Willard would say. We, we need to just retranslate our Bibles to, um, to get us, to get a sense of what's meant by, by heaven, right? And we've been talking about this all, all weekend um about this um experiences with god where you have them when you have them how often um i don't know take us take us take us through this what um what's what's the advantage we've probably all read this uh, section here. What's the advantage of what he's saying about heaven? One of the more helpful definitions of sin that I've come across is sin as the creator of ultimate loneliness. Okay. The counter to the sin is the goodness of the presence of the kingdom of God. Okay. In other words, God actually, truly being present where I am right now. Yeah. As I am right now. Right. Right. Because the, the heavens being at hand, like the beer is at hand in my fridge. Yeah. It is something that is available to me. Mm -hmm. And that for a person steeped in a culture based on the assumption that all of the cos all of cosmic reality is just tension in emptiness. Yeah. Just rewires our entire being into a dance of relationship where everything in life is a part of divine interaction. Like mm -hmm. every movement, every day, all the mundane activities of being human become intertwined and enmeshed in this divine presence. Like we do life not alone. Hmm. Even in my most alone moments, there is someone with me. Yeah. And for all that I've seen so far on my short journey as a soul carer, there is 
I, I don't find many other things that are such a potent help hmm. for people bound by shame into loneliness. Hmm. And if one of the consequences of sin is loneliness, then the active, present cooperation of the kingdom of God in our everyday lives by living in the heavens hmm. already at hand yeah. is the great antidote yeah. to what I think is our time's greatest plague, that is loneliness. Loneliness, yeah. Yeah. So, um, but where, where the the whole loneliness things and heavens, we, we 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 I don't think we've been discussing that so much during. No, no. we haven't. Where, where does that find you? Where where does that land? Yeah. In you? Um, I think. I think I do tend to be a. Um, be very f focused on the physical. Mm. So what I see. Mm. Um, so I look at a room. We're in a room now. Um, look at the corners here. You know, I just I see empty empty space. I know there's air there because I've had physics, and I guess I don't. You don't even need to have physics to know that there's air. Um, Hopefully, but but a, there's a sense of that. That's that's it. Um, air space, few inanimate objects, and that's my environment. It really is a very different um, exercise to start. You may not, to, to imagine that angels um, or our triune God is also in that space. Now, at first, it probably will be just sort of a, a thought experiment, just something that you, you know, you read it in the, you've read it in the Bible, so it must be true. So um, you just kind of think like, you know, this, this room is full of angels. Um, I mean, there are, there's this phrase in Hebrew that there are innumerable angels, mm. right? More angels than numbers, because yeah. you can't, you run out of numbers yeah, yeah, because you're... Yeah. So there's no, re I mean, there's no shortage of angels where we've got plenty of them. And, and God has also announced that, you know, he's, he's present everywhere. There's no, there's no limit to where he isn't. But the problem is that we are often not aware of it. And again, you know, we're just tied into the visible and the sort of sense of like, I, have you ever, do you have this feeling, come home, like you have a family, I have a family. So there's often someone there come home and that the house is empty because you're mm. the only one there um and that sense of like okay this is this is an, an empty lonely space i'm going to be on my own um what what difference would it make to sort of think like no it's of course it's not empty mm. um you know god's here mm -hmm. there's god's a here. there's a fullness to this place it, it's already packed Right. <laughs> the party's right. on. The party's on. I get to be here. <laughs> and I get to be here. I, I think it's a lot to be asked for just your your run of the mill disciple to step into that reality from the get go, unless you are really steeped in a, a church culture which is dominated by the practice of the presence of God. Right. So, I mean, we, we, we set the bar pretty high unless we already are in the community that's practicing that. Yeah. But taking in consideration that that would be the case, like we yeah. actually have intelligent teaching practices that help us reimagine our everyday spaces as places where mm -hmm. the angels dance all the time. Yeah. I think it just brings about another level of satisfaction to life. Like mm -hmm. we're there so much of our life as i understand god has created us is to create gaps in us 
okay. in different ways. And, and desire is what fills in gaps. Like that's the tension. And tension is the primary motor for human life in, in when it comes to our biological, physical being. Mm -hmm. So encountering a space where you think you're alone, that creates tension in you. Yeah. You want to close that gap. You want to feel that, okay, I am not alone. Because mm -hmm. when you're alone, you're unsafe. Yeah. You're outside of the pack, you're outside of the herd, you're outside of the group, you're, you're in the pale. Mm -hmm. That's not a good place to be. Whereas if your neurology is more accustomed to assuming that the space that you step into is already filled, yeah. I think you would be more at ease. Just a basic, like, you could, I think you could be able to detect that on like anxiety levels, yeah. uh, heart rate, yeah. just being more... Mm -hmm. <sighs> Yeah. present yeah. and not having to worry yeah. as much yeah. yeah but as you said it's not something that just thinking one time will help you remember <laughs> no. like it is no. you mentioned this phrase practicing the presence of god and that's that's um uh, that idea has certainly been around for a very, very long time, but it's had a, it's had a name for maybe 500 years yeah. um, and has been something that's been recommended to people. But you do have to practice it like, like anything. Yeah. Um, the more you practice it, obviously, the better you'll get at it. Um, and, you know, something that's always helped me with this is, because uh, I'm actually pretty bad at doing it. I'm pretty bad at it. Um, so... Um, when I do do it, I have to remind myself that anything worth doing is worth doing badly. Yeah. <laughs> so it's okay that I'm bad at it. I'm still, I'm trying to get better. And so you don't have to sort of feel bad about, oh, well, I haven't thought about God's presence for two days. Yeah. Like, it's okay. Think yeah. about it now. Yeah. It's worth doing. I think that's fascinating. Uh, like we, we have a tendency to set a high focus on our ability to retain in our minds the memory of God being here mm -hmm. instead of using kind of architectural, structural design elements that help us create a spiritual uh, orthopedic of our own home, which steadily points us towards God. Yeah. So instead of trying to create a sanctuary within our minds, let's start with creating a sanctuary outside of it. Yeah. Like, do you yeah. have the small pointers? What could those yeah. pointers be? Yeah. Yeah. Let's, and this is, this is yeah, an important yeah. point because yeah. I think we, um, if you have any interest in sort of home design, um, you you know, you, you're concerned about what's on your wall, what's not on your walls, or what's what's laying around. And I think sometimes you might see these, like, people who put Bible verses on their walls, or crosses, or um, portraits of Jesus and Mary, or whatever mm -hmm. it is, um, and might say, oh, I don't know, <laughs> I don't really want that kind of thing. But you see, those people are actually quite clever. Yeah. I mean, maybe some of them just put it up because they think it's cute. Yeah. But a lot of those people have put those things up because it does help them remember mm -hmm. things that are easy for them to forget. Yes. And my daughter, my daughter does this really quite naturally. She, um, I don't know, I got a, I got kind of a cross trinket is like a cross that you can hold in your hand. And I knew I wasn't going to be holding it in my hand and that. So I, asked her if she wanted it and and she said yeah yeah she said that whenever i see this i think about god yeah wonderful right that's beautiful and and she has a few other things in her room as well that she and she really likes that because uh, and i she uses it in her child yeah. childish way yeah um but um she's figured out a secret which yeah. we need as humans which is we need these vis visual reminders to help us you know, you might be so good at practicing the presence of God that you can have a kind of Scandinavian minimalist sort of house and you just don't need, need it at all. And you can do that too. Like you can asso associate in your mind certain, certain things like opening the refrigerator with thinking oh, well, about God. That's very seldom where I do it. 
<laughs> but you can. I you mean, can. N- yeah, no, but that's you... like that's kind of that's pretty hardcore conditioning. Like you, you, you put in good amount of work and time in order to get to the space. Just well, I... there are goofy things. I tell you, um, uh, there's this there's this part of the city that I run in, yeah, and that getting there is one of those markers yeah. that I yeah. use to. Um, remind myself of God's presence. Yeah. That that park. Yeah. Um, another thing that I do, super, kind of kind of weird. Often I don't I don't have the greatest distance vision. Um, I don't need glasses for it, but I don't quite recognize people at a distance. I mean, even if you do have better vision than I do, it's not a big deal. Um, but you see people, and they kind of remind you of other people. Yeah. Right. I use that as a trigger to pray for that other Wonderful. person. Wonderful. Right? And you can the you can do a lot more with that. Mm-hmm. Um, some people practice sort of training themselves for the practice of the presence of God. Things like before answering the phone. Yes. You know, things like yeah. that that they that they just use. I yes. mean you're it's like two seconds, one second that you need. Mm-hmm. And lots of lots of little triggers like that. Um, and the more you have, I wouldn't start with a lot of them, but just with a few, then uh, then some of the things like that will become easier. Do you have any? Do you have any? Little... I, a, a lot of goofy ones, yeah. Uh, yeah. And I think I, I think the goofy ones kind of have because they have a playfulness to them. Mm-hmm. They they gamify the experience. It yeah. becomes more natural for us. We're kind of we're allowing ourselves to fail yeah. because it's a game. Yeah. Especially yeah. if it has that naive, goofy, childish character mm-hmm. to it. I think it's more beneficial for us as a spiritual practice. Yeah. We come this we become the homo ludens, right? The 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 playful man, the yeah. the human who is who plays. And uh, uh, anything from uh, uh, just the way uh, we can, well, I've, I've had the food stuff as well, mm-hmm. you know, actually, that's why <laughs> going to the refrigerator and trying uh-huh. to remind me that, okay, I feed upon uh, okay. the word of God and the presence of God here, uh, that, that, that's an assumption. Uh, uh, every time you call, like, okay, this, I'm, I'm going to, pick up and it's gonna be Jesus <laughs> when I call yeah for instance <laughs> like, okay like when, when, there, when there is a call when there is like, a okay, call not like just a, me yeah specifically you yeah only you I've only picked out you no. <laughs> <laughs> okay good all right good uh, and and then also uh, like Mishnas like the do you know that uh, in in certain Jewish homes mm-hmm. as you enter it there's a little box mm-hmm. right by the wall. Like, how can you create those in your own home? Yeah. Uh, I've, I've, uh, I brought, um, which is some might call some sort of cultural appropriation, but appropriately so. Mm-hmm. Uh, a kippah home with me, okay. just to have during the Sabbath to have on my head. Okay. That's many, many years ago. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, 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 and things like that, that yeah. kind of small experiments in redefining the space I live in yeah, yeah. as a space that I share together with God. Yeah, yeah. And just this, just this place of being able to start expecting God. Mm-hmm. I think that's kind of one of the keys. Mm-hmm. Like when you come home, you kind of expect God to move with yeah, you. Yeah. When, when you're making food, you kind of expect it to be delicious because God is cooking together with you. Yeah. When you're When you're doing your... Uh, when I'm doing the dishes or I'm cleaning up the kitchen, I, I just feel like, oh, th- here I am, this bold knight of Christ, together with the High King himself, fighting entropy mm-hmm. in my little corner of the universe, like bringing kingdom order by just doing the dishes poorly, mm-hmm. uh, very not as often as I should. But still, that has kind of the the creating that playful drama around it mm-hmm. really makes life yeah. a much more interesting place to be in yeah 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 and I, I mean some of this really is a mind game and that's that's okay that's that's what you're you're doing because your your mind or your brain is just a piece of meat that you are trying to shape in certain ways by repeatedly doing um, something that might be rather rather silly mm. um 
I I want to get into a little bit of the the sort of the theory behind it or the reality mm. behind mm. it because it can sort of seem like we're just tricking ourselves yeah. into thinking that God's there. Yeah. yeah. Right? And people do that. I mean, yeah. that's that's a good part of sort of false religion is just yeah. tricking yourself into believing something that's not really real. Yeah. Um, so Dallas is going to do this here with this word heaven um, in the Bible. And he wants to, in a sense, say like, <laughs> I don't know, all you've been taught about heaven is wrong or something. <laughs> something in that, that sense. It's pretty... It's pretty drastic um let's talk about language for a while um part of his problem is he's doing this in english and english heaven in english isn't even a part of our universe like you're not going to open up your your you know astronomy or physics textbook and like find heaven in the index like Mm. um Heaven is like this other realm, afterlife sort of thing that's just, it's, it's, it has no geography, mm. right? Um, but I, I speak German, you speak Swedish and Finnish. Um, there we have in German Himmel, um, the Swedish word's very similar, Himmel. Um, Himmel. Yeah. Uh, they, they kind of do have a place in our world. Right. They also can refer to this opposite, you know, this place outside the world. Mm. Um, but it's sort of this place that's sort of pretty far up there. Like, mm. you know, I can see out of the window here, there's the trees. And then him would sort of probably begin like once you get above the trees. It's and where the blue stuff is. Where the blue stuff is. <laughs> um, and and Finnish is probably the probably similar too mm. is not exactly something that's really down here with us mm. it's mm. more like up there um with with others that's that's tricky because when you if you think when you read the word heaven mm. in the bible mm. that you're dealing with something that's either up there or completely out of the world entirely yeah. um well, that's where God's going to be and yeah. the angels are going to be. And, you know, unless you're a, a pilot or a, an astronaut or, you know, a sky jumper or something like that, you're not going to spend a whole lot of time in heaven, yeah. <laughs> um, which means you're not going to have a whole lot of time with um, with God. In fact, there's yeah. this really interesting story of uh, the, the first Russian Cosmonaut. uh, cosmonauts, yeah. Yuri, what's Gagarin. his... Gagarin? Gagarin. Gagarin, right. Yes. Who goes up into space and says, well, God's not here. Yeah, there, I don't there, see him. There's no God. There's no God. There's no God. That's his conclusion. Yeah. Yes. Because yeah. he went up to heaven. Yeah. 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 Um, okay. So uh, Dallas is going to say, yeah, um, you've misunderstood what the Bible's talking about. Um, and then he goes through lots of stories from the Bible, which mentioned the word heaven. Mm. And he says, you know, you need to take this more, more, I guess, more literally, or you need Mm. to imagine Mm. where this is, um, like where God is appearing or where, what he's doing is happening. Yeah. Um, so here, this one story of, um, Abraham about to sacrifice to Isaac and the angel of the Lord called unto him out of heaven and said, don't touch the boy. So it's not like, like, you know, you have these clouds parting and God has to shout down to Abraham. Like there's, why would God, why would God do that? Like why, why wouldn't he just sort of speak normally (laughs) to Abraham? Um, and, uh, and lots of other, lots of other stories. You all, you can read this, read this in here. Um, do, do your do these stories help in your congregation or maybe ask differently do, does do they, do they think of, of heaven as something that's close by 
do they think of heaven as something that's close by? We need to ask them. Um, I do think that there is a tradition within the Nordic Christianity mm -hmm. and I'd almost say the majority of our Western church, so to say, about placing God in a position of transcendence, which is not aligned with the biblical witness about where God is. Okay. And that is not enforced, but it is really ingrained in our collective church imagination by art hmm. by our church art yeah imagine any church that you get into just the way that the structure is built mm -hmm. there are high ceilings that yeah. go way up mm -hmm. in order to focus on the majestic um, high up mm -hmm. place that God is in, mm -hmm. where we're reaching down from below mm -hmm. up towards the light where God resides, mm -hmm. way beyond all our human worries and strife mm -hmm. and pains, because we cannot imagine God incarnating in order to partake in our suffering. Yeah. Yeah. It is such a hard leap. And every time we create art concerning heaven, we place God in heavens way above us. Right. The way angels beyond. are up there yes, too. Yes. Everything that is good and beautiful, yeah. which is a fulfilling of the platonic ideal, yeah. has nothing to do with the presence of flesh, which is our body and this world. Right, right. Right. There's this really, really ardent dualism in art because it makes for drama. It's, yeah. and, and it's not only in church art and church architecture, it's, only, it's also in our hymns, mm -hmm. in, in our phraseology, in our, in our uh, Christian poetry. Like we, we place God way out, well, like we're, we're, we're doing what, what Simon Peter does when he encounters Jesus in the boat and says, get away from me, Lord, I'm a sinner. Yeah. We can't Im imagine Jesus wanting to be close to us, yeah. heaven wanting to be here in the midst of the mess of the smelliness yeah. and the brokenness. Right. 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 So I, I, I think we have thousands of years mm -hmm. of Christian art yeah. not helping us yeah. reimagining yeah. the heavens being the place where God actually is and those heavens yeah. starting from our sucks up. Yeah. That sounds like a great challenge if we have any artist, anybody oh, yes. of visual mm. um, representation, visual art abilities. Give us some art that actually shows God and angels down here with us. Yeah. yeah. Re help us retell some of these Old Testament and New Testament mm. stories that uh, that bring it down here. That would be so fascinating to see. So beautiful. Yeah. Um. So he wants to say, in a sense, you know, you, you've got heavens in the Bible is. Um, well, you mentioned it too. It begins with your socks, mm -hmm. right? Like biblically, you want, and you know, you don't have to take Dallas Willard's word, word for this. Like, go get a uh, sort of a Bible software, or not software, but like a, a website where you can search for words and use heaven and look for all the instances. You know, they'll all be displayed on a page. You can read them fairly quickly and try to imagine how, how far away that actually yeah. might be. Yeah. Right? And you'll find that. There's no reason for God to be anywhere, you know, further than than two feet from you. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Maybe there's a little Corona <laughs> sort of COVID distancing, but again, there's no. It's not terribly far away. It's not on. It's not by the moon, or no. way up with the stars, or nebulas, or right. beyond the reach of the cosmos. Right. No. Exactly. Right. 
So that's that's incredibly important when you read these stories, when you and then when you come to Jesus, who's talking about the kingdom of the heavens, mm, mm, mm. to um, recognize he's talking about something that's nearby. I mean, it could be far away too. There's no reason God doesn't have mm. to avoid being around Saturn just because it's far away from us. No. Um, and that's where I don't know. We want to talk about this a lot. I was I was surprised to not find it in here, but if you listen to Dallas Willard's recordings, um, he he will talk about uh, sort of the Jewish understanding of there being three heavens, mm-hmm. um, and and you can you can add more if it doesn't really matter. But the idea being the first one, first heaven is is here, um, the atmosphere yeah. or air yeah. around us. Yeah including what the birds fly around in. Um, and then the second one being out there with the stars and the mm. planets. And the third one being the, the heavens of the heavens mm. is how it's sometimes described in the Bible, the highest of heavens. Um, and that being the place where our God and the angels reside. However, that is not a spatial um, heaven. That's not like once you get out to where the universe starts curving because of time or whatever, then then you finally yeah. can reach you, God's you house. Go, and you're on the other <laughs> right. This this lovely medieval um, images uh, astro- astrological chart where you have this one scientist popping their head mm-hmm. like through the yeah, the, and not the terra firma, but the 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 the, the heavens and mm-hmm. looking out on the other side. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, so that's that's. Um, that's sort of a place that's enveloping us. And if it doesn't help to think of this third heaven, then just think of God and the angels here with the mm-hmm. air and the atmosphere and in the first heaven. Uh, it's, it's been helpful to realize, at least for me, that God created heaven yeah. and earth yeah. to commingle. Yeah. Like God put a dimension of reality in which he resides Mm -hmm. within creation, intentionally creating space for himself and all his gloriousness to reside within creation. Yeah. Like, because we we have this hard time of forgetting, (laughs) we have this hard time of remembering that God created heaven and earth as a marriage mm-hmm. right this playing on the great divorce between heaven and, okay. and earth right? right in c.s lewis's term so instead like the i think nt wright has a, there's a book or a way of phrasing it like the marriage of heaven and earth mm-hmm. that's the coming together of all of reality into one seamless experience yeah. of god and and that's 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 what's waiting mm-hmm. that's our future and that future is already at hand uh, without God overpowering creation with his presence yeah. right now. Yeah. So it's been helpful to reach back in time for me to think of, okay, God created matter, creation in such a way that it is made for that one day when it's truly permeated hmm. by God's presence in the same way that the waters fill the seas. Yeah. That's where we're going. This is where we come from. Right now, we're in the awkward middle where God is present, but all of matter is not illumined hmm. by the glory of God, right? Yeah. Like there's still, there is still, there is something waiting. We're like, all yeah. of creation is like a vessel waiting mm-hmm. to be filled with, with the, mm-hmm. kind of the radiant, obvious mm-hmm. glory as mm-hmm. in is like the Shekinah really filling the temple mm-hmm. in the same way. All of creation is the temple of God that's going to be filled with that yeah. radiance of his presence yeah. and therefore not needing, needing lights, for instance, uh, for, for, for our day. So in the, be- in the beginning and in the end, those tell us the story of how we should interpret the now. And without that kind of meta narrative of uh, God's uh, Shekinah presence in uh, creation, we're waiting it then all of these kind of Christian art pieces that we have in our home become trinkets. They become kitsch 
because they don't have that robust framework of experience mm. and theology that you attach to them because you need to be looking at a painting that somebody out there is going to make that's going to be beautiful <laughs> and you're going to tell the story of oh yes all of materiality is made with the potentiality of being a receptacle vessel for God's presence. Mm -hmm. So everything has that potentiality. And in the sense, it's already here. It's yeah. not just obvious for our senses. Yeah. It can become more and more obvious for our faith. Hmm. Like we're seeing the unseen, yeah. which the heavens is. And we're learning to interact it by faith, not by sight. But we're waiting for the day when we will that which we are training in right now relating to the unseen heavens by faith will be something that we do relating to it through our senses as well yeah yeah um a lot of these experiences here that he lists are pretty exciting things um you know even even he talks about uh, Jesus interacting with the enveloping kingdom mm. day after day. I mean, mm. I don't, I've never met anybody <laughs> really like that. No. Um, as well as all these Old Testament stories about um, the, uh, the heavens. So, um, it, it can be maybe a little worrying if you... You maybe have never, maybe some people have never had no. mm -hmm. um, an encounter with God where there was like this um, sometimes visible, audible, um, or sometimes just extremely strong sense of his presence, of his of acting. Um, I think I want to just... That's that's not that's not what we're talking about mm. here. That you would have, like, those every day. Mm. I think maybe there's somebody who can who can stand that and have that much. But I've never met that person. Um, in fact, I know I even know that Dallas Dallas Willard wasn't that kind of person. Mm. Um, so, and I don't think that's the point. We don't yeah. even want to be that person because our, our wills and uh, our agency is still flabbery. Like it's still yeah. it's fluctuating. It's still oscillating. It's still looking for something. It's still being formed. Mm -hmm. And to live in that immediacy of God's present active will, which yeah. is his kingdom, yeah. would paralyze us. We would, yeah. I think we would, like, we would not have the ability to choose any longer. Yeah. We would be practically uh, stripped of our moral agency mm -hmm. in the, it, there it would be an actual terror because there would yeah. be no space yeah. for us to move. Yeah. That's kind of like, at, at least as I, I hear Dallas throughout his, his writing and speaking, for a while, God withdraws his tangible presence yeah. for us to be able to grow up and choose yeah. that which is good. Yeah, yeah. And that doesn't mean, I mean, there's sort of this low-level sense of God's presence, which is what we're talking about with the practicing of the presence mm. of God. Mm. And, and that can, can still be rather rich. Um, and, and I think that's... the the people like that's something that Dallas was actually rather good at. Mm. Um, and that I think accounts for a lot of his strength mm. in as a, as a person. Um, but it's, it's still not on the level of what we see in the scriptures mm. of um, these and what people will um, have testimony to. In fact, he, yeah. there's a section here. The experience continues today. And Dallas says, if you get a group of people together, you will find people that God manifested himself to mm. in the space around them. And, and he then tells this story of um, Sundar Singh and 
who, let me see here, I had found it here, I, I wrote it down, it, he, he saw a glorious face filled with love. Mm. Right? Now, he didn't keep seeing that face. No. Um, it wasn't, wasn't a constant experience for him. Um, it was very helpful for him in the moment. Yeah. And I don't know if he had anything else similar, but um, I think we can, I think we maybe can expect a bit too much for that. And that, that, that's a little bit of the, the doubting Thomas sort of thing here that mm -hmm. um, he even gets into. This sort of sense of like, well, unless I really get a very powerful mm. manifestation of God, then I'm going to accept nothing. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, the, and, and it's kind of like it's, uh, it's a car with a dead battery. Mm -hmm. It needs to have that jolt in order to get going. But yeah. after that, you're expecting as you drive that the battery will start charging, right? <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah, Otherwise, it's going to die again. You need a jolt again. Yeah. So that's a dead car battery. Right, right. Th that's, that's the equivalent with our life as well. Sometimes we need that jolt. Sure. There, there are times and people yeah. who, who are minifaces as like we are, yeah. that are being helped by the kingdom presently among us by a specific manifestation of it in mm -hmm. Jesus appearing in the room, filling it with light. Yeah. You hear an audible voice. You experience kind of a very intense um, sense of God being near you, mm -hmm. or you're bathing in love, or mm -hmm. you're fully accepted, or mm -hmm. uh, heavens opening up, mm -hmm. seeing angels running up and down stairs, whatever it might yeah. be. And you, you're saying you just have this realization of oh, God is real. Mm -hmm. the, this is real. It's actually mm -hmm. real. Yeah. But after that, the battery needs to start yeah. running by itself because that's what we're made for. We're not yeah. made for living off of these jolts. Yeah, because right. Because I think that would be quite devastated for, for a human mind to, like, within the psychedelic society or, or, or community, there's back in the day, there was this, you know, line that once, when, once God answers stop calling and what they meant is once you have ex an experience of of the divine stop trying to hit it up in the same way yeah because you're calling a number that's already a answered mm -hmm. and it, it it may be a crude uh analogy but there's something to it like this yeah. the seeking of the in like intentional seeking of an experiential high in order to confirm the faith that you're a bit uh, uncertain about yeah that's like going, instead of starting to work on the battery itself, mm -hmm. you're just going for the jolts mm -hmm. and you never start running. So you never yeah, start yeah, learning yeah. from your own yeah. persona to interact, like your will interacting with God without the evidence of the heavens being here, present right now. Like one, the, the starting, uh, the forward, or even just the starting page uh, the, from Uncle Screwtape, the C.S. Lewis by the Screwtape Letters. Uh, there, there has, there's this, uh, beautiful, beautiful, uh, part. It's hard to just pick it's up. It's hard to read here, but he does say mm. here, you may go ahead. Merely to override a human will as his felt presence in any, but the faintest and most meditated degree would certainly do would be for him useless. Yeah. Right useless yeah yeah so there's just it's just you know just a little bit of salt mm. and mm. i think that that a lot of it is only found if we're going to be seeking seeking him and that's really yeah, what this yeah. practicing yeah. the presence of god thing is yeah. about it's about sort of constantly seeking god um having an image of or a thought of god being present in a room may not do a whole lot for you in the moment, but that is a constant, a, in a sense, welcoming mm, of God mm, into there. And it will in time do quite a bit for you over the course of your life. And it's so interesting because you cannot see unless you know what, what it is you're looking at. 
right? Mm -hmm. uh, I, I cannot know that this is a notebook unless I know that I'm looking for a notebook, right? Yeah, okay. I, I cannot know that this is a glass unless I have some sort of understanding of what a glass is. Then okay. I'm, I'm just looking at this form. But now when I know this is a glass, I have the concept and I can start yeah. looking for a glass. I can go into the kitchen, I can yeah. open the cupboard yeah. and I know what I'm looking for. Yeah. Uh, so, so it is in the visible realm. And, and he goes on, this is a bit further on, so we're not going to dwell on it too much. But the physical things, we need to have the ability to see them mm -hmm. in order to know what we're looking at. Uh -huh. But the invisible things, i.e. God's presence in the world, in the heavens, mm. is something that has to want to become visible for us yeah. for it to be visible for us yeah so and there's the wonder like you cannot see the kingdom of god unless you're seeking it yeah it does not become visible and even though you would have the experience you know uh yes master i'm here talk your servant is listening mm -hmm. unless you know who it is you're expecting to hear from hmm. you won't be hearing god yeah. you will be hearing your uh, prophet master mm -hmm. right right yeah so so that's uh, i just mm -hmm. find that so interesting and so insightful into the kind of the the psychology of faith that dallas opens up throughout the book mm -hmm. that okay here is the dynamic the 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 door of the heart can only be opened up from the inside right yeah uh, the the kingdom can only be sought because yeah. it's as we're seeking that we're giving god the signal yes i want to see you I yeah. want to interact with the heavens that are surrounding me right now. Yeah. I can only do it by faith. And I am supposed to be looking for a life where I'm, I'm running not on the jolts from the battery, mm -hmm. but from a faith that's generating more faith through mm -hmm. experience and knowledge. Mm -hmm. More so that my entire being is more and more aligned to the way of living that Jesus lived as he walked the world as a cat that hasn't been fun. kicked. Jesus walks like this. Yeah, he does. He does like a cat that hasn't been kicked. Like a spider. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he kind of slowly floats as well. Hair little legs. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I've never... No, I've never seen that either. You don't have to put that into the art, though. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Might be interesting. It's creepy and spooky, but weird. But yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, but the I think the important thing, too, is... We, this isn't this isn't just a mind game. Mm, um, mm, mm. God is already in the air and atmosphere that we inhabit and breathe, yeah. and wherever we we go on this earth, He's already there. We're just letting Him help us recognize that presence there. And how does that impact our way? Uh, how does that impact our way of working? How does it impact your way of working? Uh, if it does. Yeah, I, I mean... Or a fairer question might be, how could that positively impact your way of working? Yeah. Um, I, you know, I think that, that uh, the perfectly safe place to be, the mm. worry and anxiety that just are a part of a life with out God, me just doing what I have to do, um, are are transformed with His His presence. Um, if I'm open myself up to it, but it's it's I don't know. It, I think this is one of those things where it's like um, a sin is very hard to do if you sort of are thinking about God's presence. <laughs> it's very awkward. <laughs> it is very. So you do end up, and this is, fun, you know, test yourself. You will put yeah. God out of your exactly. mind so you can do things that you know are wrong. Yeah. Um, uh, positively, sort of introducing God more and more into your mind, recognizing him will be a great strength uh, against sin. Yeah. Um, and, and worry and anxiety um, are, in a lot of the ways that we do it, just sinful. Yeah. Um, because they really, um, they are a statement that, you know, God's not taking care of me. This, mm -hmm. is, this is not a safe place. I need to mm -hmm. 
take care of things on my own. Mm -hmm. And um, it's a very natural um, and tempting way to yeah. tempting way to live. Yeah. 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 Thank you. That was a good answer. <laughs> I like that. Um, how do you how do you help people in your congregation? You have far more opportunities to speak to real people. Mm -hmm. um, you're also visiting people um, for uh, funerals or confirmation. Um, what I mean, maybe you can even speak I, I, ideally. Like, what would you like to tell them, or what what helps? Um, <laughs> Uh, I don't know. No. I mean, I'm I'm only five years into being a pastor for this congregation or in this congregation. So I'd, I generally I don't know. The spiritual work is slow work. I mm. mean, it, it it takes a generation to to see something mm. and to look back and go, okay, so that worked. That surely didn't, but that worked. Yeah. So yeah. I I won't I won't presume having any sort of knowledge into you know what actually brings about. Yeah. Um, the goodness of the kingdom in a in mm. in a community in mm. a in a congregation of disciples. Yeah. Um, what what I would like to see more and more so is that I can just be relaxed in God myself. Hmm. Like I don't have to worry. Hmm. Like God will take care of His people. God will take care of these youngsters and and the elderly and the dying and the and the sick and the mentally ill and the the poor and the struggling and the fighting and just us ordinary human beings. And God, God will be enough, like his kingdom is enough for, for me and for them. Mm -hmm. And no matter what we're going through, when we're going through our conflicts, when we're going through our fights as a church family, because that's what you do. Yeah. Uh, family is a place where you learn how to fight without breaking people. Mm -hmm. uh, so like even just being able to do that together with God in a way that doesn't leave us desert and, and angry and disappointed with ever stepping our, in in a church mm. that would be great like that yeah. uh, that would be a pretty high bar actually just to start off with because that would mean an active life of discipleship where we are as as a community discerning okay how do we live together uh, uh, in the view that god is always present his kingdom is always at hand. His resources are always there at our disposal, mm. in a way, through his mediation and his help. And what that would do to our budget meetings, our, mm. our, our, our crisis meetings, our meetings mm. with um, refugees as they come in, our meeting with, with uh, the, uh, the orphans and the people who have no longer a place to call home, uh, our, our youth, Mm. And the levels of just rampant anxiety and depression that's seen in, in the, the generation of young people right now. Uh, the sense of hopelessness and sense of lostness, sense of not having a identity rooted in something really good and worthwhile. Mm. Not having a, a clear goal, like how, how am I going to go about creating something worthwhile in the world? Mm. I think all of that would be... Um, met in an adequate enough way with just this work of discerning God's presence among us mm -hmm. through the heavens and the kingdom activity that comes about living in that interaction as a community yeah. not just as a couple of a few strewn out uh, disciples here and there who are actively mm -hmm. practicing the presence of God but uh, as a community assuming that God will move. Yeah. That would put me at ease. Yeah. All right. Last question. Um, your guy who's, who you started a number of spiritual formation groups in your life, uh, in your student days, but also in the church, which I just learned about here, you started some. So how would you say go about um, now starting spiritual formation groups and let's just assume that is as in most places most churches nobody knows what that is 
Nobody knows what spiritual formation is. They've never been in a spiritual formation group. So now you want to invite people to do this. What do you think we should do? Is discipleship and spiritual formation uh, say a natural thing for a Christian to do, being already thought, taught in that church? Um, yeah, let's let's assume that you know somebody like you is is in charge of the the, the teaching, so they can kind of mention those kinds mm -hmm. of things. I, I would I would pitch it as a project, as an experiment. Okay. Uh, for for deepening the Christian life, and focus uh, either do a a one focus group, uh -huh. um, where you're just looking at at something that people are already aware of, for instance, an issue in life, loneliness, anger, lust, greed. I wouldn't pick lust or greed to start off with okay. because people are very seldom. Loneliness is something you could mm -hmm. work with mm -hmm. and bring them together. What about, what about anxiety and fear? Anxiety and, and fear would be wonderful, but you get, I'm not sure if you can deal with that as a pastor. You need to have a team of pretty, okay. pretty well versed soul care people okay. around you as well. Because you're gonna you're gonna gonna end up with a really anxious group. <laughs> so well, I would at least not recommend they probably, that. <laughs> they probably already are anxious. Yeah, you're just but they're not the together. Anxiety <laughs> out in the front of them. Yes, and they're gonna be multiplied because of the anxieties of others. Yeah. So I would not suggest starting off there, but doing some sort of experiment and really opening it up as something we're testing together. We're discovering this together, and there needs to be a genuine sense of okay, we don't know what's gonna happen. Mm -hmm. Like I don't know the ending of this book. Yeah. I don't know where this journey is really going to take us. Okay. So there is an excitement, there's an anticipation, mm -hmm. there's an openness to change, mm -hmm. and you will attract the people who are willing to mm -hmm. do that work. Okay. Because it need, it's need the, the, uh, uh, it needs to be uh, a high enough bar, so you need to take one step. Mm -hmm. Like you don't want to start a spiritual formation group with, which is basically just uh, for those who are really on the bottom, because that's not where you start off. Yeah. 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 Good. Yeah. So it, it's somewhat semi-functional. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Members of the congregation who are able to have some sort of autonomy in their life. Yeah. And they have a little bit of time that they can dispose of as they wish themselves. Okay. So they have the resources, they have the willingness, and they they are. Uh, capable of interacting to a, a high enough degree that you can have a conversation about mm -hmm. tough topics mm -hmm. in their lives without them completely lashing out at you at yeah. once. Yeah. If you have that, then you can create a, a, commu a small community. I would say 8 to 12 people. Okay. Max 12. I would aim for 8. Mm -hmm. 4 to 5, uh, it's a bit too tight. Okay for a spiritual formation group, because you need to have uh, a space of anonymity where, anonymity where you can start exploring, okay, who am I? Mm -hmm. This person does not really know me. So mm -hmm. there is a, a, a possibility of identity shift yeah. in relationship to that person, where you're exploring this identity of the yeah. disciple. Yeah. If it's tight enough, if it's too tight, then there's, there's, you're just already gridded and you're set in your stone in your identity and your story. That's already, you already know what to say and everybody know, expects to know what to say. So there won't be a lot of movement for change in, in such a setting. So eight people. So you at least have a couple of people to whom you can practice this new identity as a disciple yeah. and relationship with. Uh, uh, frequency, start off with something intensive, mm -hmm. some sort of, I, I like the alpha uh, group model where you have kind of a startup meet especially if you have people who don't know each other that well from, from the beginning, you're going to have a slow slog if you're only doing an hour a week, for instance. Yeah. So you're going to do a full term before people know each other. Yeah. Instead, do a full day or a, even a day and a night yeah. at a retreat center somewhere else where you establish a group and you establish uh, commonalities, you get to know people, yeah. you establish trust in the group because that's what you're going yeah. for in the yeah, beginning. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You become a place where you know it's safe to be you yeah. and where you are welcomed as you are because you can keep up appearances for a, a week, a night, yeah. right? Yeah. If you do it for a full weekend, you, it gets strained. 
yeah. and people can notice that okay yeah. so this is you, you know, let's let's peel off the mask oh yeah. there you are okay yeah. so that's 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 sufficient and the same thing somewhere in the middle if you do a long project and then in the end when you're kind of concluding and make it into something that has a clear start and a clear ending i would suggest nine months mm -hmm. with a a good start and, and like a day together at least in the beginning and a day in the end and something somewhere uh, like a retreat in the middle of some sort mm -hmm. together with the people and then have a frequency of once i think once a week is good because there's something that you need to have enough time in between so something actually happens yeah yeah uh once a month uh unless you're really really sharing life together outside of the mm -hmm. group it's going to be hard to keep up mm -hmm. that level of trust so you can have meaningful conversations uh i would start off with just the renovare spiritual formation workbook okay for 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 the group just because of you have something which is given yeah you don't have to you know make it up as you go uh i've been a part of a couple of of groups where we we we're, we're intentionally experimenting with new forms of 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 of, of disciplines mm -hmm. uh, we had uh sub uh, this sounds no that's not the right we can't use that word in english uh you play pool uh and your focus in playing pool is trying to get the other person to make their best game okay so so you're working with your uh, competitiveness and so forth i mean you can do things like that but i wouldn't start there i would mm -hmm. start with a program like the spiritual formation workbook or mm -hmm. uh james uh brian smith's the good and beautiful series or uh -huh. something like that that has a has a progress has a format and it's something from outside so then you're willing to criticize that right and you can have a conversation about the experience that you're having and if it's bad you can always blame it on the book if it's good you can assume that god is moving in a special way amongst the people which are you gathered there in yeah. your place and then have evalu evaluation like actual evaluation like this this did this impact my life am i living in a way in which i'm more and more uh, uh, assuming that god will work from the heavens from the surrounding atmosphere from the air where i am on a day to day basis mm -hmm. are my levels of anxiety lower am i more uh, prone to being helpful or mm -hmm. available or uh, am i in a more efficient way not working in a life of uh false martyrdom uh, where i'm just bleeding my life in order to get recognition and instead standing more firmly in god's love for me and therefore mm -hmm. being able to put healthy boundaries around me yeah. whatever might be the challenges that you're meeting in 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 becoming more and more like christ in your life uh have something that you can work with and work on that's specific measurable small attainable uh and start off with uh, so little that you almost are contemptuous toward it all right that would be That's, one those person. are some i mean i'm gonna use that <laughs> I, the, I, I thanks for breaking that down for us <laughs> and thanks for thanks for talking talking with this uh, uh with us with me with me it's with just me. me well the all the heavenly realm is around here like, well, yeah. can you imagine all the innumerable angels just perking their non-physical ears as we speak yeah well i um i i think god is involved in what we're doing here so um uh thanks for doing it with me yes thanks, Mark. um and to you all thanks for watching and or listening Thanks for getting all the way to the end here. Um, you should um, sign up for the almost monthly newsletter over at sanctus.institute. And uh, we will see you next time with our next guest in the next section. But until then, bye. Bye now. All right. Move on. Yeah. yeah. I don't know how long that was. But... I will find out when I put it in and like have to buy a new computer because it was so, such huge file sizes. All right, well, let's need to make it any bigger than it already is.